Okay, good morning, friends. It's a nice summer's morning. Hope you're enjoying the weather. Yeah, I usually put the fans on in the summer. We put the heating on this morning. So. I was talking to Clarice from South Africa just before the service, and I said it's probably warmer in your winter in South Africa than in our summer here. But uh, that's how it goes. Praise the Lord. Anyway, we can still have the warmth of the Lord and the love of the Lord in our lives, whatever circumstances. Okay, I'm going to continue looking at the book of Revelation, so if you'd like to uh, turn to Revelation chapter 2. Last time I spoke on this subject, we did Revelation 1, so we'll start with the letters to the seven churches, Revelation chapter 2. Let's just have a word of prayer as we come to the word of God. Father, we thank you for your word, pray you'll help me as I speak and help those who hear, and we pray that you'll guide us by your spirit into all truth. Pray this in Jesus' name, Amen. Revelation 2, verse 1, to the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven gold, golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your, <clears throat> your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you've tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you've persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Praise the Lord. A uh, message to the church at Ephesus. Uh, as you know, if you go through Revelation, you have messages to seven churches. This is actually the last written word we have from Jesus in the scriptures. Uh, the glorified Jesus in heaven, who John had has seen in a vision in chapter 1, gives a word to John uh, concerning these seven churches. And the churches are all in this area around Ephesus. It starts off with Ephesus. Ephesus was the main city in this area. And you have uh, churches spreading uh, geographically to the north, south, and east of Ephesus. And uh, the tradition was that John was actually the bishop of Ephesus at the time and was an influence to the area round about. Uh, The seven churches have uh, messages to those who are gathered in the churches, which one has to conclude from looking through these churches actually contain, contain those who are Believers walking with the Lord and those who are not. And there is a kind of separation between those who are following the Lord and those who are not. And there's a commendation to those who are following the Lord and a warning to those who are not. Probably the uh, letters to the the book of Revelation, uh, according to my understanding, was written round about the year 96, um, which would be the times of persecutions under the Emperor Domitian. Um, We're told in chapter 1 that uh, John, verse 9, where John says... I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island of Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Uh, So John was on the island of Patmos, which was uh, like a penal settlement off the coast of what is now Turkey and the islands um, in the Aegean Sea. And John was there, not willingly, he was there as a prisoner. And the Lord revealed the revelation to him. And he gave him these letters, which are seven letters, which are to the seven churches. If you look through the letters, you'll find they all have a similar structure. Uh, There's an address to a particular congregation. There's an introduction of Jesus, a statement regarding the condition of the church, a verdict from Jesus regarding the condition of the church, and a command from Jesus to the church, and a general exhortation to all Christians. begins with a message given to the angel of the church. Um, A question for them is, is that... Does every church have an angel looking after it? Uh, Is it an angelic being who is looking into the workings of the church? Um, Actually, the word angelos in Greek, as the word malach in Hebrew, which is translated angel, uh, also means messenger. And you do find that in the New Testament, the word angelos is used occasionally um, just for a messenger. When John the Baptist sends messengers to uh, Jesus, the word used is angelos. So, uh, the mess- word does actually mean a messenger. And you could say that the messenger actually is uh, 
the person who's giving the message to the, the church, so the pastor or the teacher. Uh, so it could be seen as a message to those who are responsible for the teaching of the church to either get their act together or to uh, be encouraged. Uh, so you have a message to the, uh, the church, but certainly it's a message from the Lord to the church. Each it begins with the phrase, I know your works, so God knows the works of the church, God knows intimately what's happening within the church. A promise to those who overcome, and a exhortation to hear the, what the Spirit says to the church. All of the messages contain a commendation or a condemnation. Actually, two don't have any condemnation. One has no commendation. One which has no commendation is the last one, the church at Laodicea. Um, how do we interpret these? These are actually real churches, so they existed in God's day. Um, some ways they're similar to churches which would exist right through the church age. Uh, so there is a prophetic message, if you will, to uh, Christians living through the, Christ- the church age from these, these, uh, these messages to these specific churches. Um, it has been said that one type of church is going to dominate uh, throughout the church ages, so you have a picture of the development of the church through the church age uh, in the letters of the church- churches. And the first one, the message to the church at Ephesus, deals with the uh, church which was predominant in the post-apostolic age, uh, the last one, Laodicea, speaks to the kind of church that would be predominant in the last days, the age in which we live in. So what's also significant is that these, if, these are, if the letters were written around about 97 or 96 to 97 AD, they were written to churches which have been going for a while. So uh, if you like, the second generation churches. So they're a message to the, from the Lord to these churches. So it begins with a message to the church at Ephesus. Uh, Ephesus of these seven churches is the one which we know most about. You have quite a lot in the scriptures concerning uh, the city of Ephesus. It's a place where Paul preached. Um, it was an important city in the Roman province of Asia. It was a religious and cultural and economic center of the region. Uh, there was a great temple there, the Temple of Diana. And if you read in Ephesus in Acts chapter 19, you have uh, the account of what happened when Paul was preaching in Ephesus. Uh, where this great temple was and people were making idols. And as a result of Paul's preaching, the people began to uh, not want to buy their idols anymore, and it was causing actually a commercial crisis because people weren't buying the idols, which led to a riot in Ephesus. Uh, And you have the very dramatic account of that in Acts chapter 19, uh, which tells you actually that Paul's preaching must have had a pretty big effect upon the city because uh, people were changing their lifestyle. They weren't buying idols anymore. They weren't... uh, uh, contributing to the financial wealth of the uh, temple in, of Diana, which was actually one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was a, a very important temple, a very important place. Um, historians also tell us that in Ephesus there was a, uh, a, a treasury and a bank where merchants and kings and even cities made deposits of money. Uh, so not only was it a religious center, it was also a financial, a cultural center and a financial center where uh, there was a great deal of money stashed away uh, under the temple, I guess, or around the temple. Um, Acts chapter 19 also tells us that um, it was a place there was a great deal of what we might call the occult, um, sorcery and magic books. In fact, in Acts chapter 19, you read how as people became Christians, they burned their magic books and uh, there was a very large quantity of magic books which must have been burned because they were valued at a price which I can't remember what it is today, but it would have been considered to be a huge amount of money. So there was a place, place of a lot of corrupt, um, idolatrous worship, financial center, a place where there was a great deal of the occult and uh, magic and the sorcery taking place, which uh, could sound a bit like London today. Uh, so a lot of... Uh, similarities in in our culture. Uh, We read that Paul ministered there for three years in Acts chapter 19. Uh, Paul also handed over to Timothy, his uh, disciple, as it were, to continue the church in in, uh, Ephesus. And Paul wrote the letter to the Ephesians, obviously, to the church in Ephesus. Uh, And we read also in the book of Acts that the word which uh, went from Ephesus was well known, the word word of God which went out from there, in fact, in Acts 19, verse 10, it says, this can, uh, Paul continued for two years so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. 
uh, which implies that it wasn't just in Ephesus, but in the surrounding region that uh, the word of God was going out. And maybe that's why we have these seven churches which were planted in the areas round about Ephesus to uh, preach as a result of the preaching of the gospel. Um, And we were also told from his story that the Apostle John actually uh, ended up as the bishop in Ephesus. So John uh, went to Ephesus himself and he ministered there. Uh, So let's see what we can learn from this uh, passage here, which uh, is a message addressed to the church in Ephesus. First of all, it begins with the description of uh, Jesus, um, and in each one of the seven churches you'll find there is a reference back to the vision which John had of Jesus as the Son of Man in chapter 1, where it says, These things, says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Uh, If you go to chapter 1, you'll see that Jesus there is described as having the seven stars in his right hand and walking in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. In verse 20, it says, The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. The seven lampstands, which you also saw, are the seven churches. So the lampstands actually stand for the churches. So Jesus is walking in the midst of the churches. Um, This tells us something, again, about the Lord Jesus, that he is the risen, ascended, glorified Lord. He's in heaven, but he's also in the churches. He's uh, dwelling within the church. And in fact, Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, I'm there in the midst. Uh, So Jesus is walking in the midst of the churches, and he is gathered, as we gather here today, we're gathering unto him. We're gathering unto Jesus, who is the Lord, who is present amongst us as we gather in his name. And Jesus owns the church, as it were. This isn't our church, it's not my church, it's his church. Uh, He's the one who rules over it, and the church belongs to Jesus. And he's the head, and we're the body. So we should worship him as the head, and we should give him the honor uh, that he is the risen, ascended, glorified Lord, and at the center of the church. He should be the one who is walking in the midst of the church, because it's his church. Okay, in verse 2, he says, I know your works, and each one of these... uh, Messages to the seven churches begins with these words from the Lord Jesus, I know your works. Uh, Jesus looks at the church and he knows what's going on. Again, that can be a somewhat awesome thought, doesn't it, as well, that Jesus looks into the church and he knows what's going on. He knows everything that's happening. Um, It's a verse in the Old Testament which says, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. Uh, So the eyes of the Lord go right through the churches. He knows what's happening. He knows everything that's going on. Uh, He's the head with the body. He knows what's going on in his body. And uh, again, that is a thought which sometimes we sort of blot out of our minds, don't we? That Jesus actually sees and knows what's happening here. He knows what's happening in our lives. He knew what was happening there in the church at Ephesus. And uh, he begins by commending them. He says, I know your works, your labor, and your patience. You cannot bear those who are evil. You've tested those who say that they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars, and have persevered, and have patience, and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. Uh, He commends them for their works, their labor, and their patience, Uh, which reminds us that God does want us to work in his name. We are saved by faith, and in fact, if you look in the book of Ephesians, you see that uh, in Ephesians, Paul has told, told us that we are saved not by our works, but by our faith. But having come to faith, that then uh, in Ephesians chapter 2, it tells us that God wants us to walk in newness of life, in good works that are pleasing to him. Let's just read Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. It says, By grace you've been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Uh, So we're not saved by works, we're not saved by our labors, but having been saved, then God wants us to labor for him. He wants us to have a fruit and a work which will be uh, pleasing to him. And he sees, uh, as he looks at the church in Ephesus, that they have labored for him. They've worked for him. They've preached the gospel. They've sought to build up the church and to uh, teach the truth concerning the word of God. Um, He said that they've also exercised discernment. You cannot bear those who are evil. You've tested those who say they're apostles and are not, and have found them to be liars. 
Uh, so there has been a work of discernment taking place in this church to separate that which is from God and that which is not from God. And again, that is something which is important right through the Christian era. <clears throat> we can see that if you uh, go back to the book of Acts, there's uh, actually a warning from Paul concerning this very issue. Uh, the last words of Paul to the church in Ephesus. If you go to chapter 20 of Acts, uh, Paul gathered together the uh, Ephesian elders as he was setting off on his journey to Jerusalem and he said that this was the last time he was going to see them but he says uh, start in verse 25 he says indeed I know that you all among you whom I've gone preaching the kingdom of God will see my face no more therefore I testify to you that I'm innocent of the blood of all men for I've not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God uh, so Paul has declared to the Ephesian church the whole counsel of God. Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among you, which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. For I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after themselves. Therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Uh, so Paul exhorts the elders of the church there to take heed to the flock, to remember that this is the flock which has been purchased by the blood of Jesus. And he warns them that after his departure there will come savage wolves who will come in among you not sparing the flock. So he warns them about uh, wolves in sheep's clothing, if you like, people coming in who will be deceivers, whose aim will be to take the people away from their true faith in the Lord Jesus and to produce some kind of substitute faith which will be actually speaking perverse things, speaking things which are not right in the sight of God, seeking to draw away disciples after themselves. And uh, if you look through Church history, you look at through churches today, you can see that that is very often a problem, that people come in who actually want to dis draw away disciples after themselves, and they're not teaching them the truth about the word of God, they're teaching things which will lead them astray, and as a result, they are uh, described as wolves in sheep's, sheep's clothing. And the purpose of this, their actually aim is actually to devour and to destroy the, the church of God, not to build it up. Uh, so false teachers will come in and create havoc in the church. Uh, we see that um, this is also something which Paul commends to Timothy to be aware of as he takes over the uh, apostleship of the leading of the church in Ephesus. We go to 1 Timothy chapter 1. It says, as I urged you when I went, this is 1 Timothy 1, 3. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies which cause disputes rather than godly edification which is in faith. Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience and from a sincere faith which some having tr from which some having strayed have turned aside to idle talk, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor the things which they affirm. We know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, knowing that the law is not made for a righteous person, but, not, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly, for the sinners, and for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers or manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers, and if any, there's any other thing which is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which was committed to my trust." Uh, so Paul's saying basically stick to the gospel, stick to the basic truths of the gospel, preach the gospel, tell those who are sinners to repent and believe, uh, to follow Jesus, uh, and that there'll be come, coming, people will be coming in who will stray from the truth, who will teach things which are uh, fables, which are fiction, and will lead people away from the truth, a departure from the truth. Um, he also warns about this in 2 Timothy chapter Three, where he says, uh, verse 12, Yes, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution, but evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived, but you must continue in the things which you have learned and have been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. 
From childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all on suffering and teaching, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. They will turn away their ears from the truth and be turned away aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. So you've got a number of warnings there, which Paul gives. Uh, interestingly, some of them are connected with the church in Ephesus uh, and also with Timothy, who was going to be his, uh, his representative, if you like, in Ephesus. Uh, warnings not to heap up for yourself. Churches, uh, teachers are going to teach you what you want to hear, but teach what God says, what is the truth. And often people don't want to hear the truth about God because they don't want to be convicted of sin, they don't want to repent of sin, and they don't want to put their trust in Jesus the Messiah. Uh, but we have to always go back to the basic message of the gospel. That doesn't change. Uh, the world may change around us. We may have all kinds of different temptations and difficulties facing us in the 21st century than they had in the day, days of Ephesus. Uh, but still, it's the same problem of sin. There's the same devil going around seeking to devour and to destroy people. And there's the same salvation through repentance and faith in Jesus. And the message of the gospel always to go back to the beginning, to what it was in the beginning, and not to heap up for yourself new teachings, teachings which will lead people astray. And one has to say that today the church uh, at large is full of false teachers. Uh, you know, um, I only go to this church now, but, uh, so I don't have much experience of other churches. Uh, but uh, certainly before I became leader of this church, I was involved in other churches, and you could see that they, the churches went astray, churches which actually began to teach things which were not true. And I think a lot of people actually come to this church because they've come from churches where things were going wrong, where there were things being taught which were not right in the eyes of the Lord. And we do see a, a departure from the truth, uh, an apostasy, a falling away from the truth, which is itself a sign of the last days, according to the Bible, uh, as people will be giving heed to fables, fables which are basically fiction or man-made teachings, uh, teachings which often have a demonic inspiration behind them. And today we have in the church much uh, which is teaching people things which are contrary to the word of God. Uh, but uh, sadly, if you go to Bible college today, it's, or theological college, it's like you're going to hear a lot of what is called liberal theology, which will make you uh, disbelieve the scriptures. And uh, that's one of the reasons why there's so much uh, confusion in churches, because people have been through Bible college where they've been taught actually to disbelieve whole sections of the Bible, creation, uh, sometimes the miracles, the virgin birth, the resurrection of Jesus even. Uh, and as a result, the person comes from, through, through a Bible college and then ends up teaching in the church. What are they going to teach the people in their churches? End up with a lot of unbelief and confusion. Uh, we have ecumenism, liberal theology, uh, <clears throat> people joining together with other churches uh, which are not biblically bound, uh, and even with other religions seeking to bring all religions together in one. All these things are actually, as far as God is concerned, fables and fiction, and they're taking away from the truth of the gospel. Um, compromise over moral issues, and you have all kinds of strange and uh, weird things going on in churches, actually, don't you? Uh, with uh, prosperity teaching. Sometimes I don't actually watch the God channel too much, but uh, every time I turn it on, it seems to be somebody asking you for money and promising you that if you give them the money, then you're going to get more money back yourself. And uh, promises of uh, miracles are going to happen in your life if you give them some money, uh, all of which seems to me to be totally contrary to the scriptural principles about giving to the Lord and also about praying in the name of Jesus. Uh, we have uh, claims which are being made which are totally untrue. We have prophecies about revivals coming which don't happen. We have uh, a lot of things taking place which actually cause people to be disillusioned and to turn away from the Lord. Well, we don't know exactly what the false teachers were teaching in the days of, uh, of the Church of Ephesus, but uh, uh, Paul warns against them and it appears from the 
uh, message which is given by Jesus here at the, to the church in Ephesus that they had heeded those warnings. Uh, so that there had been a discernment taking place and that the message you're giving here is to those who had tested those who say the apostles are not found them liars and have rejected their teaching. Uh, so there has been a response to the warnings given earlier and the church of Ephesus has resisted uh, false teaching and accepted uh, the truth concerning the gospel and they persevered in the truth. Uh, so that's a commendation to the church at Ephesus. But there is a rebuke which the Lord has in verse 4. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you've left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and reprove, remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Condemnation here is that they've left their first love. Um, What is their first love? I guess it's their love for for Jesus, for the word of God, and their love for one another. Um, Where do we get our love for God from? Does it come from ourselves, or does it come from him? Uh, Actually, in the book of John, it says that we love him because he first loved us. Uh, We come to receive from God because of the love which we have, which he has given to us. And... uh, it would seem that uh, in the time when Paul was writing the church, the, to the letter of Ephesus, uh, that the love which the brethren had for the Lord and for one another was well known. Uh, if you go to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15, it says, Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Uh, He's heard of their faith and of their love for all the saints. So that was back in the time when Paul wrote Ephesians. Now Jesus is saying that you've left your first love. So there's something which is missing in that church. Uh, They were known for their love for God and for one another. Now they've departed from it. They once had a love which they don't have anymore. And you could say this is a, a departure which has taken place. Now again... When we think about this, um, it can feel fairly convicting. Uh, and sometimes, you know, when I read this passage myself, I think, well, have I lost my first love? Do I love the Lord as I loved him when I first became a Christian? Uh, and I guess we can all feel, that, yes, probably there is a, 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 something which we left behind, uh, and God wants us to return to that. So we have to remember that whatever love we have has come first from him. We love him because he first loved us. And as a result of that, we should love one another um, as we recognize who God is, that God is love. John chapter 1, sorry, 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested towards us that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. And verse 19, we love him because he first loved us. Uh, So whatever we know about love actually comes from God, doesn't it? And it comes from God as it's revealed in Jesus, that God who so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And uh, if you believe that, if you know that God's loved you so much that he sent Jesus to die on the cross for you, to bear your sins, to suffer, and to be the sacrifice for the sin of the world, uh, and to die in your place, uh, be buried and rise again from the dead, to give you eternal life. Uh, he loved you so much, so you should also love him in return. And the love which God gives to us through Jesus is the love which is a response to the love which he has for us. And if we do love God, then we should love one another as well. Uh, maybe one way in which the Ephesians lost their first love was actually part of the process of the discernment, which I was talking about earlier. But as they were looking out for people who were teaching the wrong things, they became 
very critical and very uh, suspicious even of others. And that, I think, is something which can happen in this place as well, that as we uh, seek to maintain the truth and to keep uh, the truth concerning doctrine and the, the truth, we can actually end up being quite suspicious of people and um, watching out for them, discerning whether they are true or not, and not having love one for another. We need to have the truth. We also need to have love for each other. And if people say things which are wrong, we need to correct them if necessary, but also to love them and not to uh, have splits and confusion and d- disputes because of issues which relate to uh, doctrine. We need to love and to seek to resolve things in the Lord. Uh, perhaps seeking to, root, seeking to root out error have made these Ephesian Christians critical of each other, suspicious and lacking in love. Perhaps also as a second generation of believers, they'd grown lax and become cold. They didn't have the first further of the first generation. And this lack of love actually led to spiritual apathy, which eventually leads to the decline and death of the church. Formalism, coldness, dead works uh, take place without a living relationship to the Lord. And God wants us to have that living relationship with the Lord so that we can uh, have express his love in our lives, love for each other, and our love for God. Uh, We can also perhaps lose our love for the Lord, even just coping with everyday things of life, work, money, family, all the pressures of life uh, squeeze out God from our lives and we end up not giving any time to the Lord. Uh, Sometimes discouragements in life as well can cause us to lose lose our love for him. Uh, Expectations not being met, health needs, uh, problems in relationships, Problems in the church, uh, all these things can cause people to lose their love for for God and for each other. Um, Also, one has to say the wickedness around us, the influences of the world. Uh, John says, love not the world uh, and the things in the world. And the the world around us, uh, the world system is actually very much against God and against his love. (coughs) Jesus said... Uh, Because wickedness or lawlessness will increase in the last days, the love of many will grow cold. So as the influences of the world, which are contrary to the Lord, impact upon our lives, so we begin to lose our love for Jesus. So, what's the answer? Uh, Well, John gives it here, or Jesus gives it here. Uh, Remember from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly. So the answer is actually to repent, to turn back to the Lord. Uh, remember where you, perhaps where you, where you, where you've fallen from. If you can think, go back to the place where you did lose your first love. Um, change your mind and have a different attitude to the Lord, and do the first works. Uh, what are the first works? Um, well, he doesn't tell us actually, so <laughs> we have to think about it. Well, what, what are the first things which we did when we first became believers? Uh, did we spend time reading the Word of God? Did we love to read the Word of God? Did we spend time with the Lord? Did we have time of prayer when we love to be with Him and to praise Him and to pour out our hearts before Him? Did we love to get together as Christians, to meet together and to have fellowship one with another and to exalt the name of Jesus? Did we like to tell people about Jesus and to delight us when we had the opportunity to share our faith and to uh, bring the message of the gospel to others. Uh, Not out of a legalistic duty, but out of love for Jesus. Um, And those are some of the things which uh, perhaps God wants us to repent and return to and to experience that love of God in our lives so that we may express his love to the world around us and be a good testimony. And of course... Also, the love comes from the Holy Spirit. Paul talks about the love of God being shed abroad in our lives by the Holy Spirit. So God wants us to be filled with the Holy Spirit in order to receive the love of God and to express it into our lives, the lives of people round about us. Then he says, But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So he has now another piece of commendation. 
um, you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Um, we're not actually told in Scripture what the deeds of the Nicolaitans were, so we have to see if we can find out what it is. Um, one view is that the the Greek words Nicolaitans actually is made up of two words in, in Greek, Nikaio, which means to rule over, and Laos, which means the people. Uh, so some have said that the Nicolaitans were actually those who uh, ruled over the people, um, developed, if you like, a sort of clergy class who were set apart from the people and who were ruling over them in a way which was uh, not building up the church as the body of Christ. Or it may have been that there was a sect of that name. Um, if you look at writings of the early church writers, there was um, writing from a man called Iranius, who was writing in the late second century, uh, who was actually a disciple of the Apostle John, he describes what he knew of the Nicolaitans. He says, The Nicolaitans are followers of that Nicholas, who was one of the first seven ordained into the diaconate by the apostles. They lead lives of unrestrained indulgence. The character of these men is plainly pointed out in the Apocalypse of John as teaching that it is a matter of indifference to practice adultery and to eat things sacrificed to idols. Uh, another writer, Hippolyt Hippolytus, um, associates the Nicolaitans with the Gnostics. There are, however, some among Gnostic diversities of opinions, but Nicholas has been a cause of the widespread combination of these wicked men. He departed from correct doctrine and was in the habit of inculcating indifferency of both life and food. Uh, so from this, it would appear that there was something wrong with the uh, teaching and the character of those who followed this Nicholas. They uh, taught things which were wrong in the sight of the Lord. Uh, they practiced sinful things, uh, adultery and eating things, sacrificed to idols. Uh, you could say it was kind of a licentious sect which taught people to love God and do what you like. So if you love the Lord and you do what you like. Uh, freedom in Christ means that you're free to do uh, as the world does, to participate in heathen feasts, practice uh, sexual morality. And the Ephesians were commended by the Lord for hating this. Um, the word hate is actually used quite often in the Bible, uh, especially in the Old Testament, for forms of worship which are opposed to, to the Lord. Um, God hates What God hates in the Old Testament is always connected with some distortion of worship and involvement in practices which are contrary to God's commandments. Um, for example, in Isaiah 61, verse 8, he says, For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery for burnt offering. I will direct their work in truth. I will make with them an everlasting covenant. I hate robbery for burnt offering. Uh, could actually compare that in some ways to the prosperity doctrine, actually, that God was actually hating people who were exploiting people by getting them to give to the, uh, in that case, the priests, but not to, to the Lord. Uh, Jeremiah 44, verse 4, it says, I have sent to you all my servants and prophets rising early and sending them, saying, Oh, do not do this abominable thing which I hate. But they did not listen or incline their ears to turn from their wickedness to burn no incense to other gods. Uh, so a combination of idolatrous worship with uh, worship of the Lord is something which God hates and God uh, commends the Ephesians here for uh, hating the deeds of the Nicolaitans I said when we can't be totally sure from the, certainly not from scripture we can only know from uh, writings of the early church something about the Nicolaitans but there's clearly something concerning them which was offensive to God and the Ephesians were commended for uh, rejecting this uh, and I think sometimes in modern Christianity we can accept all kinds people seem to accept all kinds of distortions of truth and accept unrepented sin and sinful practices into the church which are actually things which God hates which God wants people to repent of uh, we're not to hate the sinners but we are to hate the sin and God tells us to hate things which are contrary to 
the will of God and to the word of God. And especially if it's done in the name of religion, uh, blinding people to the truth in Jesus. So then we have the promise, and there's a promise which concludes the uh, message to the church at Ephesus. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Um, the message from the Lord was return to your first love and overcome, overcomers in, these church, in, these, uh, in this will be those who do what the Lord says, who obey him. Um, some people are, have read one doctrine that overcomers are a special elite group of Christians who manage to get into the throne room while the rest are left outside somewhere. Uh, but actually overcomers in the scriptures are simply those who overcome by following the Lord, by repenting and following him and believing in him. 1 John 5 verse 5 says, Who is he who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? How are you going to be an overcomer? You're going to be an overcomer by believing in Jesus. That's the message which is given in the scriptures. And if you believe in Jesus, if you follow him, you have faith, you have eternal life through faith in the Lord Jesus. And he says, to him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. If you go back to Genesis chapter 3, you'll find that the tree of life was planted in the Garden of Eden. And after Adam and Eve sinned, they were expelled from the Garden of Eden that they might not eat of the tree of life and live forever. Uh, Jesus died on the tree on the cross that he might be the sacrifice for the sin of the world. Uh, and he died so that we might be forgiven for our sins and have access to the Lord and be born again into his kingdom and share in the eternal order. In Revelation 22, verse 2, says, it, he showed me a pure river of the water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There should be no more curse, but the throne of God and of his Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there, they shall need no lamp, nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Uh, eating of the tree of life here is seen as being part of the eternal order, and being with God forever in glory. And if we believe in Jesus, then that is our ultimate testimony, uh, to be with the Lord, and to eat from that tree of life, and to be with him, and to be worshipping and praising him forever. And we'll have that reward of being in abundant life, which is in Jesus, both now and in eternity. So the message to the Church of Ephesus is to restore and rekindle the love of Jesus, which we had, they had at the beginning. Uh, maybe that's the message which can speak to you and to me, that God wants us to repent and to believe and to overcome through the blood of Jesus and to walk in his ways and to know that as we believe in Jesus, we have a glorious future in the kingdom of God and we shall eat of that tree of life uh, spiritually if you like now we can eat from the tree of life through faith in Jesus uh, and in the world to come literally we will eat from the tree of life uh, as we are with God in heaven so let's uh, take to heart what God says to the church at Ephesus and uh, apply it to our lives just have a word of prayer. Father, we do thank you that you do know our works, you know our labor, perhaps our good deeds, but you also know, Lord, that we fall away from you. Lord, we do pray that you would restore to us the love which, our first love, our love for you, Lord, and that you would restore to us the love for God, for one another, and that we might be able to express that love through our lives. And we thank you, Lord, for giving us Jesus, the one who has made it possible for us to know God and to be forgiven and to be born again into your kingdom. So bless us, we pray, and may we know your life flowing through us. And may we be able to express your love for you and for one another. In Jesus' name, amen.